Good afternoon. I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the uh, Foreign Policy Research Institute based in Philadelphia. Today, we have a distinguished panel that is going to discuss the implications of UN General Assembly Resolution 2758. That's the, that's the resolution that, uh, that gives and designates the China seat at the UN. Uh, we're also going to be talking about China's August 2022 white paper on Taiwan issues. And here to uh, moderate our panel is Jacques Delisle, who many of you know, who is the director of our Asia program here at FBRI. He is also the professor of political science, professor of law, the Stephen A. Cousin professor of law and political science. He's also the director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. We'll also be taking your questions today. So if you'll look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A box. Please put your questions in there and start feeding them to us um, as soon as you think of them, because we sometimes, I think Jacques sometimes draws on them in his moderation of the panel. So um, also like before I turn it over to Jacques to give a hearty thank you to our board and our supporters and our members. We can't do this without you. I'm fond of saying it's free to you, but it's not free to us. So please, if you're not in one of those giving categories, consider uh, doing so. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jacques. Thank you, Raleigh, and thank you everyone for joining us today for what I think is going to be a terrific discussion on a very timely topic. I'm going to briefly introduce our two panelists and then we'll uh, get to the meat of our discussion here today. Uh, Bonnie Glaser is director of the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Before that, she was for many years at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where she was senior advisor for Asia and director of the China Power Project, also senior advisor with the Freeman Chair in China Studies, uh, and a senior associate in CSIS's International Security Program. And before that, she serves as a consultant for US government departments, including defense and state. Uh, you can find her work in places like the Washington Quarterly, China Quarterly, Asian Survey, International Security, and other journals in the field. Uh, you can frequently find her quoted in major newspapers like the New York Times and Washington Post. Uh, she also writes regularly for the Comparative Connections uh, Journal of the Pacific Forum. Uh, but more to the point, she is one of the leading analysts, a top handful of leading analysts of Taiwan issues, cross-strait issues, and China security issues, and it's terrific to have her joining us here today. Uh, joining uh, Bonnie and me is Jessica Drun, who is a non-resident fellow in the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub. Before that, she was a non-resident fellow at the Project 2049 Institute and a China analyst at SOS International Center for Intelligence Research and Analysis. She's also worked at the National Bureau of Asian Research, the National Defense University, and CSIS. Uh, she too works on cross-strait relations, Taiwan domestic politics, and U.S.-Taiwan relations, and she's a rising young star in the field. Uh, so we get both uh, the established stars and the, and the new ones to discuss this topic today. Uh, we're coming up on the 51st anniversary of the uh, resolution uh, that we're going to be discussing today that Raleigh mentioned in her introduction. And I also recommend to everybody uh, the report that Bonnie and Jessica put out uh, with the German Marshall, U.S. German, that's right, German Marshall Fund of the United States called The Distortion of U.N. Resolution 2758 and Limits on Taiwan's Access to the United Nations, which obviously is quite close to our topic uh, today. So if you want to, a little bit of a deeper dive into some aspects that we're going to talk about, I recommend you look at that report. You can find the link to it in the chat section uh, on the Zoom page that you've uh, got on your screens now. Um, so let's uh, begin for those who may not be into the arcania of UN General Assembly resolutions uh, and how they matter for uh, Taiwan and its international participation. Let's begin with the, the big question here of uh, giving us just a, a quick view of what UN General Assembly Resolution 2758 is and what it did in terms of Taiwan and the People's Republic of China's engagement with the United Nations. I'll turn to Jessica for that. Thank you, it's great to be here. So in 1971, uh, UN member states voted on UN Resolution 2758. The language of the resolution itself is very short. It simply says that it is, um, that the representatives, uh, Chiang, the representatives of Chiang Kai-shek will no longer be holding the China seat at the UN, paraphrasing here. Um, the, it's important to note that the language of the resolution does not mention the words Taiwan. Um, so at the point at that point in time, 
If you look at uh, the meeting minutes of what the member states were discussing, as well as a number of resolutions that were initially on the table. So there were originally, I think, seven resolutions, as well as a number of amendments that member states would be voting on. They decided to only vote on what ended up becoming UN Resolution 2758. Um, so the resolutions considered did include ones that would come to a final determination on Taiwan's status at the UN. However, those were tabled, which essentially tabled, those is tabled that issue at the UN level. Um, it, this is all also reflected in what the member states were saying when they were voting um, in the official record. They said that the only determination would be who, who the PRC or the RRC would hold the China seat at the UN. The status of Taiwan is not up for question. And perhaps most importantly, this was also reflected in Chinese viewpoints at the time. Uh, in a conversation between Zhou Enlai and Henry Kissinger prior to the vote, Zhou Enlai told Kissinger that if the resolution proceeds as it is currently framed, the status of Taiwan is not yet decided. So at that point in time, the question was simply who would hold the China seat at the UN. Um, but we've seen China push a creeping narrative over the past 50 years, more so in the past 20 years, that essentially says that UN Resolution 2758 substantiates its one China principle. And we've seen this push starting more or less in the 2000s. So prior to that, they wouldn't mention UN Resolution 2758 in the same sentence um, as the one China principle. In the early 2000s, you started to see them say it as separate in the same sentence as UN Resolution 2758 and the One China Principle. And most recently, you've started to see them tie it together by saying that UN Resolution 2758 affirms or confirms the One China Principle. And that's the language that they're using today. And that's the language that they um, used in the most recent white paper. Okay, thanks. That's a terrific overview. And we should probably also point out that uh, 2758 occurred after several years of the United States uh, and others pushing back against uh, switching the Chinese seat. It had been declared an important question. And so we saw this movement, uh, as your, your paper goes into in, in some detail, saw this movement toward more and more states at the UN uh, being willing to support uh, the swap in seats. And it came to that. And, and you've uh, given us a quick overview of the details since then. So, so I, want to, I want to turn to Bonnie uh, to, to follow up on the last bit of Jessica. Because uh, remarks, which is how exactly has uh, Beijing tried to affect the interpretation of 2758 and other related UN documents? We've got you know a WHO parallel uh, resolution and, and, and many other sources that get into this question of, of China's and Taiwan's status. So how how has China tried to manipulate this in terms of keeping Taiwan out of the United Nations and out of international space more generally? Well, thanks, Jack. Um, I want to build on what Jessica has just said and start by defining what the One China Principle is, uh, because Beijing says this is their, their position, that there is one China in the world, that Taiwan is an inalienable part of uh, China's territory, and that the government of the People's Republic of China is the sole legal government representing the whole of China. And, and U.S policy, which we, of course, we have a one China policy. Um, we, rep we do uh, accept that the PRC is the sole legal government representing the whole of China. But the United States and importantly, many other key countries in the world, uh, Japan, Canada, Australia, just to name a few, um, do not say that uh, Taiwan is uh, is part of uh, China or part of the PRC. So what we've seen uh, Beijing do is to distort the original text of Resolution 2758 uh, to uh, uh, conflate the, the One China principle um, with, uh, with the resolution itself. And um, I wanna quote from the, from the white paper, which the Chinese just released over uh, one month ago, uh, where they said that the resolution settled once and for all the political, legal, and procedural issues of China's represented, representation in the UN, and it covered the whole country, including Taiwan. Uh, obviously, this is false because Resolution 2758 did not say that Taiwan is part uh, of, uh, of the PRC. Um, further, the White Paper states that Resolution 2758 um, is a political document encapsulating the one China principle whose legal authority leaves no room 
uh, for doubt and has been acknowledged worldwide. But again, it has not been acknowledged and embraced by the 193 member states uh, of the UN. So essentially the Chinese say that Taiwan doesn't really um, have the right to participate in international organizations. Although, you know, it's interesting, just a few days ago, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi was speaking at the Asia Society in the New York, at, at, in New York, and uh, he said, Taiwan should not be allowed to join any international organizations with sovereign implications. I mean, that's actually uh, pretty similar to the policy of the United States, which is that Taiwan should be allowed to join international organizations that don't require sovereignty for membership and should have meaningful participation in international organizations that do require sovereignty. Neither the United States nor Taiwan are pushing for Taiwan to become a member um, of the UN. And yet, um, China is making it difficult for Taiwan to even participate, which of course it used to because um, when Ma ying was president in Taiwan, uh, China did allow Taiwan to become an observer at the World Health Assembly and allowed Taiwan to send one delegation as, as a guest of the president of the International Civ Civil Aviation um, uh, uh, um, uh, Committee, so um, uh, organization, the uh, ICAO. So I think, um, um, as our report published earlier this year, um, there are these instances even where UN documents have been revised to advance the PRC's positions. You know, we discovered two international telecommunication union documents, uh, one from 2000 and one from 2017, that used to say Taiwan in the original versions, but that word has now been changed to Taiwan, comma, province uh, of China. Um, and there are even instances where NGOs have been threatened to have their UN access and accreditation restricted if they don't comply with Beijing's demand to use Taiwan province of China. So this is something that, as Jessica said, has evolved um, in the net from the 90s to the 2000s and now has become a very strict policy that uh, China has and a, a clear assertion that UN Resolution 2758 established the um, you know, the one China principle in the United Nations. Um, and very few countries are willing to stand up and say that that's not so. Okay, let, let's, let me just pick up on that last point, <clears throat> which is uh, why so many countries are not willing to say that that's not so. And we certainly have seen uh, over the decades from the 70s onward of more and more countries, more and more governments switching diplomatic ties, formal diplomatic ties from uh, Taipei to, to Beijing. Uh, overwhelming number of countries do that. A very small handful uh, retain formal ties uh, with Taipei, and those have started shrinking again uh, since Tsai Ing-wen became uh, president. But but there are a lot of countries that don't have a lot of skin in the game, right? They, they do not have an obvious reason to be on either side of this. So why has Beijing been so successful in, in uh, what tactics has it used to achieve uh, that kind of uh, success? Uh, is it simply the, the matter of Beijing's, of China's, the PRC's scale and importance, or do we see them using particular tactics uh, to get other countries to side with uh, their positions on this UN? Jessica, you want to go first? Sure. Um, so I would say two points. The first is that, you know, general understanding of Taiwan um, in the global community is probably not where it should be. So a lot of countries don't fully understand the nuance in, um, you know, the different one China policies that as Bonnie has highlighted. Um, but China has also in a way squeezed acceptable discourse on Taiwan through mechanisms such as UN resolution, such as what it's doing with UN resolution 2758. And there's a mutually reinforcing element here, right? By using UN resolution 58 and conflating it with the one China principle, they're saying this is essentially an international norm. And then they try to force this onto other countries to accept the one China principle, to say that the one China principle is an, inter is an international norm, therefore your space for action must abide by the one China principle. And it, then also conflating you know, countries one China principles with one China policies. Um, at the same time, um, around the time of the resolution, China was very good at pitching an anti-colonial narrative to get the support from countries from the global south. 
um, and that has continued to this day, but we're seeing that they're applying it in a different way. Instead of sharing a common narrative of anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, they're also applying pressure to smaller countries um, that might be willing to, that might otherwise be willing to speak up um, in regards to Taiwan at the UN. And we've seen this, um, we feature it in our report where some African diplomats said that if they insofar as mention voting in support of Taiwan or bringing up the issue, then their home embassies or their um, home governments send a message to the UN saying that China is essentially threatening to withhold economic benefits. And just to, to pick up on one of your points there, this sort of international norm uh, business there, essentially it's, it's one of the many arrows in the uh, quiver of China's lawfare, right? So this claim that the way we figure out what international norms, including ones with legal significance, the way we figure out they exist is to look at the practice of state. Uh, and there's obviously not a lot of tangible practice on this sort of thing. So it's what states say. Uh, and you know, as you get more and more uh, countries either signing on to this position or at least acquiescing in China saying what it says, uh, the argument is that sort of crystallizes into this view and then uh, Taiwan is stuck with it. Um, and there's also the bit of this flavor, and we've seen this with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in a rather different way, um, where it's being portrayed by China, and correct me if I'm wrong in this, but it's being portrayed by China as if it's almost an authoritative interpretation of 2758 by the countries that signed on to it, right? It's, it's a resolution, arguably ambiguous in its language, that if everybody who voted for it uh, years later says, oh yeah, we think it means X, uh, where X is China's version of the One China Principle, uh, then they've kind of accomplished a, a neat and fairly common international legal trick to say, poof, uh, Taiwan has no claim to exist separate from the PRC. Um, okay, so I want to look back to something uh, Bonnie said, and of course, you know, feel free to follow up on what I just said if you want, but look back to something Bonnie said about Wang Yi's interesting statements, which did sound a little softer edged, perhaps in some ways. Um, so what does that then leave open to Taiwan? Does it, does it leave open the possibility, say, of both uh, parties' applications to CPTPP uh, being allowed to go forward without uh, China blocking uh, Taiwan's undertaking? Does it suggest maybe that we might uh, in the future see some relaxation of China's recent um, uh, refusal to allow Taiwan to participate in UN meeting organizations, or, or, or is that just uh, overly optimistic? Bonnie? I think that it has been clear for some time that Beijing has preconditions for Taiwan's participation in UN affiliated organizations. So they do not oppose under all circumstances participation, but Taiwan must go back to its acceptance um, that uh, Taiwan and mainland China belong to the same country, uh, which was at the core of the 1992 consensus that was reached between the representatives uh, of Taiwan, then ruled of course by the KMT um, and the representatives from Beijing. And so if there were a future leader in Taiwan who returned to that 1992 consensus uh, or some version of it that accepted that the two sides of the strait are part of one country, um, that would satisfy that precondition. And then the two sides of the strait could have a discussion about um, what are the circumstances under which uh, Taiwan could participate in a particular organization. And of course, as you know, some UN uh, organizations have charters that have observer status like the World Health Assembly, um, others do not. Um, uh, and, and so there is no one, um, one size fits all answer to Taiwan's participation in, uh, in UN uh, organizations. And, and that serves China's interest, of course, because they would want to negotiate each one uh, with Taipei. But under the current government in Taiwan, and, and I would uh, speculate under any DPP government, um, this is all a moot, moot point uh, because there would be no acceptance of the 1992 consensus and China would continue to block any form of participation uh, by Taiwan in the United Nations and any of its organizations.
fair point. And so we're back to essentially the conditions that China laid down when Tsai Ing-wen became president after her first election in, in 2016, the 92 consensus uh, and the one China principle. Uh, but even in the heydays of, of cross-strait rapprochement under Ma, uh, Taiwan's observer status in the WHO wasn't really within grasp either. It was the sort of ad hoc uh, show up and participate in the annual assembly uh, with the annual invitation uh, conditioned on the kinds of, uh, of, of restrictions that we've been uh, we've been talking about here. Um, okay, uh, Jessica, did you want to weigh in on this point? Sorry, um, I guess I would just add. Um, I know Bonnie touched a bit on the memorandum memorandums of understanding that China has secretly signed um, with at least one that we know of specialized agencies um, with of the UN, and this one is the World Health organization that essentially in the language of the MOU, which we don't have full eyes on because it's it's not public, but we've been able to get um, insights on what it entails based on um, implementation memos um, that have been leaked. It essentially in practice puts Taiwan subordinate um, to the PRC within this organization um, because it says that any coordination with Taiwan through the WHO must be um, must be channeled through PRC government organizations. So we're seeing kind of the one China principle in practice um, and institutionalized at the UN level. Yes, and, and particularly striking, of course, is the not only the secret MOUs, but as you point out in your report, the rewriting of some prior documents. That, Reminds me of an old Soviet joke that in the Soviet Union, the future is certain it's the past that's always changing. And we're seeing a little bit of that <laughs> right here, perhaps. Um, now, I want to pick up on a, another thread here, which is, of course, uh, you, you've done this deep dive into the UN, which is the most important international organization. And, and particularly, uh, 2758 was a big deal because one of the permanent five uh, veto-wielding power shifts and all of that. Uh, but China's real prize here is to advance unification of Taiwan, uh, or at least to prevent any further slipping away. So could you speak a little bit to why this UN fracas that we've been talking about uh, matters for China's ultimate uh, prize here, which is at minimum uh, marginalizing Taiwan internationally so that it's not in a uh, position uh, to claim much separate state-like status, uh, and ideally, and perhaps increasingly insistently, to make some kind of progress toward unification. How does this advance that agenda? Well, I think it's quite dangerous from Beijing's perspective if there are members of the international community that do not support China's one China principle and this core that uh, that Taiwan is actually part of of, of China. So uh, I think it's it's a matter of preventing. Um, any legal recognition by any countries, and of course, particularly by the United States, uh, any to lend any legitimacy to Taiwan's claim to be an independent sovereign state. Um, I think that's a large part of it. I think that the Chinese view this as a slippery slope, that if Taiwan were allowed to be an observer in one organization, um, it would then lead to others. And then one day they would wake up and there would be a large number of countries in the United Nations that would say, well, wait a minute, Taiwan seems like a normal state. It's participating in all of these organizations um, separately from, uh, from the People's Republic of China. Um, and increasingly states would uh, conduct their relations with uh, Taiwan in, in a way that seemed to recognize it as, uh, as a separate state. So I think that China is very nervous about beginning to move down that path. And they probably um, are, believe that uh, the United States actually has a hidden agenda of, of promoting uh, Taiwan's participation in the international community in order um, to uh, it advance its status as an independent sovereign state, even though, of course, the United States says, and President Biden has reaffirmed, the United States does not support uh, Taiwan independence. Nonetheless, I think that the Chinese view support for Taiwan's participation in the international community is just one step removed from that, um, and they want to prevent it from happening. 
So I think that's the primary reason that the Chinese are so adamantly opposed to allowing Taiwan any kind of a voice um, in, uh, in the United Nations. Okay, that's a partial answer to one of the questions we've got in the chat, and I do want to encourage people listening in to submit more questions for the Q&A function. But one of our questioners uh, in that space uh, asks, why does China seem to be caring much more recently about uh, moving forward on unification? Is that something they've always wanted but just couldn't achieve power, within not have the, the capability to push, or is the current regime uh, changing uh, priorities? So, so Bonnie's given us the important part of the answer that says this is a, almost a somewhat defensive move, at least vis-a-vis -vis China's ultimate goal, that is prevent uh, things which impede uh, that progress of fear that Taiwan will slip away. Uh, is there anything else we should have on the list of explaining why China seems to have ratcheted up uh, pressure a, a bit? Um, uh, Jessica, do you want to speak to that? And I'll give Bonnie a chance to weigh in again. Sure. So I would say um, two points. The first is that um, with how with um, deepening U.S.-Taiwan relations, especially some of the actions from the previous administration, um, China's viewing it as the U.S. hollowing out its one China policy and moving away from what they view as longstanding agreements um, between Beijing and Washington. The second is um, the DPP inherently makes Beijing nervous um, because of the perception that they're separatists and pro-independent, even though the current administration has um, stressed that it's pro-status quo. Um, this is fundamentally because the DPP is unable to come to a common one China baseline with the PRC. And in that case, any sort of um, direct contact is a non-starter for Beijing. And to that point, uh, domestic political trends in Taiwan in terms of how closely Taiwanese identification ties in with party preferences is also trending away from Taiwan's preferred outcome. So we're seeing now from public opinion polls that the vast majority of Taiwanese, I don't have the numbers in front of me, um, identify as uniquely Taiwanese instead of both Taiwanese and Chinese or as uniquely Chinese. And that tends to track with how um, domestic politics will go in the future. Yeah, it's, it's been, that, that polling trend has been quite interesting as we've seen this uh, diminution to near zero of only Chinese uh, identity. Uh, and there was a time, of course, when saying you were Taiwanese, or at least both Taiwanese and Chinese, translated into some degree of support for formal independence. Now those two lines have diverged. Identity is way, way up, uh, but uh, support for, uh, for, for declarations of formal independence is, is down, which I think is probably a testament to the realism, uh, as Shelley Rigger has pointed out, of people in, in Taiwan. And so from the mainland's perspective, the, this drift is, is, is a concern. You've, you've put the, uh, the sort of popular uh, opinion uh, data uh, behind it. Um, uh, Bonnie, do you want to weigh back in on this, this question? Yes, I do. I, I think that there is something to the point that as China has amassed greater uh, power uh, capabilities that China has become less patient uh, about achieving its goals. Uh, this is, of course, um, a sort of uh, a part of their propaganda, but it has been led by Xi Jinping himself where he said at the uh, last party Congress in October of 2017, that reunification is a requirement for national rejuvenation, the target date for which of course he set for the middle of, uh, of this century. So uh, I, I think that this has, has really not been bottom up in China. I think it's the people um, that have been indoctrinated with the importance of the return of the last major piece of China uh, that has yet to be reintegrated into, into the country. Um, uh, after the uh, full return of Hong Kong, um, uh, there was not a lot of pressure, but under Xi Jinping, I think that he has pushed for uh, reunification um, even, even more. Uh, but ultimately, he has not said that it has to be done by force. He emphasizes a great deal that uh, peaceful reunification is still China's preference uh, as to the way to actually achieve that integration of, uh, of Taiwan with, with the mainland. But um, although some people do talk about there being earlier um, deadlines, uh, some have talked about uh, 2027 is a deadline, for example. We have not seen uh, that in any authoritative Chinese writings that 
Uh, China has not said that it even has to have the military capabilities to seize and control Taiwan by 2027. Uh, so um, 2027 is a deadline for acquiring military capabilities, but it hasn't been connected explicitly with the mission of uh, seizing and controlling Taiwan. So some of what you read, um, I think, just doesn't reflect uh, what China has actually said. Fair enough. And uh, a couple of striking things seem to me out of the white paper were the linking, it's been in prior statements, but it's, it's, it's put formally there, the linking of the National Rejuvenation Project with uh, territorial recovery. I mean, this is Xi Jinping's big thing, uh, and now getting back Taiwan is, is quite explicitly linked. We always knew it was a goal, but now you, it's essentially a declaration of we can't achieve the number one goal unless this uh, step along the way is, is part of it. Uh, the other thing I thought was that the one country, two systems model, as described in the white paper, uh, is a little less generous, uh, partly because of, of the tone and some of the assurances that have previously been there being dropped, but also partly because it was set in this rather tone-deaf characterization of how well the one country, two systems model has worked in Hong Kong, which of course has made it uh, less attractive uh, in, in Taiwan. Um, but I wanted to, to, to get to one other factor that people sometimes cite as driving Taiwan, driving China's uh, somewhat more assertive posture on this in, in recent years, and that is that it's a reaction to U.S. policy. You both alluded to this a little bit, but I want to dig a little deeper uh, into that. Um, I, I agree with Bonnie's implicit uh, suggestion that that uh, maybe in, in policy discussions in the U.S. there's too much a, an inference from can implies will. That is, if China develops the capacity, it will then uh, perfunctorily use it or promptly use it to achieve its goal. Uh, but, but again, part of this, this surely is, is the U.S.-China dynamic now. And if, what I want to ask you both is, has the U.S. been handling this issue well, the question of uh, Taiwan's engagement in the U.N. And, and maybe a bit more broadly internationally? But let's start with the U.N. focus. Uh, as your report uh, details, the U.S. issued a non-paper in 2007 uh, that pushed back against China's efforts to reinterpret 2758, it, it laid down some pretty clear markers, and this was partly prompted by uh, secretaries general of the UN drifting uh, in, in the direction of China's uh, interpretation. Um, and we've seen the US supporting, and I think it's fair to say in the last few years, uh, being a little louder in support for Taiwan's meaningful participation in international organizations. We've seen Congress get into the act in a way we hadn't seen in years past with bills not just proposed, but actually passing. Uh, that encourage U.S. closer contacts with Taiwan generally, but specifically support for participation in international organizations and a degree of carrots and sticks approaches to other countries that do or do not uh, uh, keep or sever or, or, or make uh, diplomatic ties with Taiwan. And of course, uh, there's a series of statements by President Biden. Uh, we've got four of them now on the U.S. commitment to defend Taiwan and two on the question of Taiwan's self-determination on the, on the uh, autonomous or separate statehood question. So there's a whole bunch there. Uh, feel free to swing in whichever piñata you prefer. Uh, I guess I'll start with Bonnie on this, then go to Jessica. Well, I'm going to start with the narrow question of support for uh, Taiwan's participation in the United Nations, and then we can branch out from there. And I do want to remind uh, your listeners that the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Rick Waters, about a year ago, uh, stated in a public event, which we held at uh, the German Marshall Fund, he said that the PRC has misused Resolution 2758 to prevent Taiwan's meaningful participation. And he said that Taiwan's exclusion from UN activities creates an immense cost uh, to the nation as well as to uh, the members of the UN. And he said that Beijing is denying the international community the ability to gain valuable contributions that Taiwan offers. And I thought it was a very important but actually quite rare statement by a US official. Um, the US has very rarely publicly said that uh, Beijing is distorting this uh, resolution 2758 um, and very rarely pushes back on uh, China's efforts to embed the one China principle um, in the United Nations. And uh, I, you know, I think that the United States should make clear that its support for Taiwan and the UN has nothing to do with emboldening Taiwan to pursue Taiwan independence, which it certainly does not. 
Um, perhaps there are things the U.S. could do to reassure China that our support for Taiwan and its participation in things like the World Health Organization, the International Civil Aviation Organization, or Interpol, or things like that, um, is not a step toward backing Taiwan's independence. But all of that is very difficult against the background of um, a series of very inconsistent and confusing statements um, and actions by the Biden administration. It would take me a very long time to catalog all of them, uh, but um, things like taking down the web page and from the State Department and taking out the sentence that says the United States doesn't support Taiwan independence and then later putting it back in um, or um, having uh, the Secretary of State probably mistakenly twice refer to Taiwan as a country. Um, uh, in the Trump administration, Taiwan was referred to as a country in a in a Defense Department document. So um, there's just been inconsistencies. And so there is a, a an enormous effort by the Biden administration, I think correctly, to try and strengthen deterrence to prevent China from actually using force against Taiwan. But people seem to forget that a component of deterrence is reassurance. And if there is no reassurance to China or inadequate reassurance that our, actually our one China policy is intact um, and it means that there are limits to what we will do in supporting Taiwan, then I think that we are headed down a dangerous path. Okay, thanks, Jessica. Sure. Yeah, to add to Bonnie's point, um, I think over the Mon administration, the U.S. stayed silent on um, Chinese influence of the U.N. in regards to Taiwan. And even then, even under a common one, one China 92 consensus baseline, China was still squeezing Taiwan's international space in different ways. Um, as we highlight in our report during the Mon administration, there were Taiwanese citizens trying to join or trying to enter UN facilities, be it for um, specialized conferences focused on science or technology, and they were kept out the door saying that the Taiwanese passports were unacceptable. Um, I think in recent years um, with the global pandemic, there has been, as you mentioned, a surge for Taiwan's meaningful participation at the WHA. Um, but I would say, you know, there was a piece in The Diplomat recently by Taiwan's Minister of Transportation and Communications that is talking about how Taiwan needs um, greater backing to have a seat at the table at the International Civil Avi Aviation Organization. And I'm not seeing the same level of support there, even though in his piece, he highlights how after Pelosi's visits with um, the increase in military activities around Taiwan and closer to Taiwan, that um, it has left the Taiwan Flight Information Region, which doesn't receive direct communications from ICAO um, with its work cut out for it, having to redirect flights to ensure um, safety for commercial aviation. And I think that's something that the US and like-minded countries and allies can do more on. Yeah, we have a question in the chat that overlaps with some of what you've, uh, you both have just said, but I want to put it specifically to see if you have anything to add. And this is from Voice of America China branch reporter Tina Chung. And she says, does the issue of Taiwan's meaningful participation at the UN, is it, is it gaining more support? Uh, uh, Wang Yi's speech uh, suggests once again that uh, China claims it is the sole legal representation of, of China, all of China, including Taiwan, under 2758. What we haven't seen this year, uh, she asks, is our actions similar to last year's by the U.S. or other like-minded countries, uh, such as Secretary Blinken's statement urging the countries to support Taiwan's participation at the U.N.? Uh, is this a correct view that this support has waned somewhat? Uh, if so, why? Whoever wants to take a crack. I'm not clear um, on everything that the United States has said, but I think that behind the scenes, the United States um, does encourage other countries uh, to support Taiwan's participation in the international community. I will speculate, and this is only speculation, that in the aftermath of Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, that there is a high level of anxiety um, in the U.S. government um, obviously, China is very concerned about the possibility of the Taiwan Policy Act passing or some of its provisions, and there is a greater sense of 
caution um, to not uh, be um, perhaps uh, provoking uh, China at, 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 at this particular juncture. I don't think that there is diminished U.S. support for Taiwan's participation in the international community, but I think we are in a somewhat uh, sensitive and, and, and maybe sort of uh, fragile period. I'm waiting for things to calm down perhaps a bit after the Pelosi visit and the Chinese reaction, uh, which was quite a reaction, as, as we all know, although those were not yet. other things going on there, too. Uh, sorry, Jessica, do you want to weigh in on this point? Um, I would just say, and I don't have timelines in front of me, oftentimes um, U.S. support and support from allies and partners comes whenever there is a critical meeting, um, such as of the World Health Organization, in which time, you know, there will be statements in support of Taiwan's participation within that specific organization. Um, but I'm not sure on the timelines of when those are occurring. Yeah, we, we certainly did at the last WHA assembly did see the U.S. making fairly forceful statements in that direction. And uh, you know, there has been in the last couple of years some hope that such pressure might be more effective because of COVID. I mean, the, the, when Taiwan first was able to attend, it was partly Wang Zhou becoming president in Taiwan a more uh, acceptable leader to Beijing, but it was also in the aftermath of SARS. I think there was some sense that you might see this. Uh, happening here, but but uh, to no avail. There's another somewhat related question in the chat. Uh, I also should say that that uh, it is at least uh, at least in U.S. legislation there there's a reinforcement of the policy of supporting Taiwan's participation. The Taipei Act is is quite um, explicit on that. Although how much it binds the president is you know another question for a separate podcast on separation of powers or something. Um, we have another question from Julian Ku, uh, a law professor who who works in this field. Um, basically asks what should be the desired end goal for U.S. policymakers with respect to Taiwan's international status. Uh, would Taiwan be satisfied with membership in international organizations uh, that do not require statehood, which is something the U.S. is, of course, willing to support? Uh, and if not, uh, if ta Taiwan wants more than that, if the Chinese suspicions are, in effect, uh, correct, uh, are we pursuing the right policy by doing what we're doing? <laughs> Well, Julian Ku, you are rather suspicious of Taiwan's intentions here, um, but I fear that your um, uh, that your suspicions are not well founded, at least uh, in the presidency of Tsai Ing-wen. Um, and uh, we don't know what a future president would do, but I would say that um, the United States probably would not support Taiwan pushing this any further. Um, than uh, meaningful participation uh, when Taiwan used to push for membership in the United Nations. The United States um, strongly encouraged Taiwan to move away from that position, and ultimately it did. Um, and uh, I, I believe that Taiwan would put if Taiwan makes progress toward meaningful participation, it then would put U.S. support and the support, of course, from other countries at risk if it tried to push for more. So there would be great disincentives for it to do so. Uh, but fundamentally, I don't think that um, that's what the current government in Taiwan is, uh, is thinking about. Um, and I doubt it's something that would happen in the near future. Right. But as you say, some of it is the concern about the slightly over the horizon future. Uh, the, you know, Tsai Ing-wen, like Meng Zhou, has been a president who has navigated these areas in ways that haven't given the, New the U.S. the kind of heartburn that Ma's predecessor, uh, Chen Shui-bian, did. And, and of course, Bonnie was alluding to uh, Chen's on the way out the door referendum in 2008, asking if Taiwan, asking Taiwanese voters if Taiwan should seek membership in the United Nations under the name Taiwan, hugely provocative, and it led to an extremely unusual slapdown uh, by a senior U.S. official, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Christensen, then saying, you know, you're using, we, we respect your democracy, we respect, respect your right to hold a referendum, but please don't do it in a way that's going to blow up U.S. interests by dragging us into a uh, cross-strait conflict, and as, uh, or, or at least crisis. And as Bonnie points out, um, you know, we haven't seen that since then. Um, but there is concern about after Tsai what, if the DPP wins and it's a more, um, in the Taiwanese political vernacular, deep green uh, uh, candidate. Uh, and uh, you do see things from the U.S. side that have raised concerns as well, things like the Taiwan Policy Act, uh, which if it were to pass, would sort of take things up to the next level. 
um, in terms of, of, of declaring the nature of the relationship between the U.S. and Taiwan. You get at least some voices in Congress for recognition, uh, reestablishing diplomatic relations, things like that. Unlikely to happen, but, but, uh, but clearly uh, the source of, of some uh, friction. Um, so, so Jessica, you, you do uh, some work I know on, on Taiwan domestic politics. Uh, is it right for Beijing and for Taiwan's friends in the U.S. Uh, to worry about what things look like after the next presidential election uh, in Taiwan in terms of where Taiwan will be on the agenda we've been discussing today, which is to seek meaningful participation but not really push the envelope uh, beyond that, to seek engagement with the UN and civil organizations but not return uh, to the 2008 or even 2003 to 2008 uh, status quo ante. I think it's a little too soon to tell. We still have one local election before the 2024 general election, but I would say looking at the trends and identity politics that I highlighted earlier, um, it's probably looking like a DPP president in 2024, barring you know any major incident, and it's likely going to be Lai Ting De, um, the current vice president. And you know, a lot of commentators say this, Tsai was kind of the best DPP president that um, China and the US were going to get in terms of how moderate, how that, that she's taken on a moderate position. Um, I would say there's a few things to look at going forward. Um, a lot of discussions are on the 9-1 local elections in November, um, but I don't think enough attention has been paid that on that exact same day, November 26, I believe, of this year, Taiwan's holding its first referendum to amend the constitution. Um, so on November 26, um, there will be a vote on whether Taiwan should lower the voting age um, from I want to say 23 to 18. No, 20 to 18. Sorry about that. Um, and so what's interesting is that 20 year olds can current, sorry, 18 year olds can currently vote for referendums, but they cannot vote for elections. Um, so it's too soon to tell how the, what the outcome of that referendum is going to look like. But if it does pass, and the numbers right now aren't great in support of it passing just because for a constitutional referendum, the threshold is 50% of all eligible, eligible voters, which I believe is 9.8 million in Taiwan by 9.6 um, in 2020. Uh, don't, don't quote me on those numbers, but uh, the thresholds are very high. But that said, we've been surprised many times by youth activists in Taiwan, right? We've seen it through a number of student movements. And if this does pass, it introduces, I think, from what I recall, half a million 18 to 20 year olds to vote in the 2020 presidential election. And what that means for you know, Taiwan domestic dynamics could be significant, um, especially because young people in Taiwan tend to identify as more green. So would that shift kind of the median line of Taiwan domestic politics more towards the green side? What does that mean in terms of how the LY election, the legislative union elections will turn out? What does that mean? Will it empower perhaps deeper green forces in Taiwan? Um, those are all questions that we will need to ask um, as November comes around. And which Lai Qingde shows up, the warrior for Taiwan independence or Tsai's vice president, uh, Tsai's rival for the renomination or, or her uh, relatively loyal second in command now. Um, then, of course, we have the local elections uh, before that. So plenty to watch in Taiwan politics. I'm sure we'll be doing an event on that as it draws nearer. Uh, we're getting a little bit close to the end of our time here. So I, I do want to turn to another substantial portion of your report, uh, which is essentially a set of policy recommendations. And, and so I guess I want to put the question of, what is the U.S. doing wrong and what is the U.S. doing right if the goal is narrowly to push back against 2758 as interpreted by China, a little bit more broadly to uh, support Taiwan having meaningful international space and participation, and still a bit more broadly than that to, to do what has been U.S. policy since you know, the Taiwan Relations Act and, and, and before even, uh, to um, you know, avoid a coerced solution on Beijing's terms in a way that's not acceptable to people in Taiwan. So take that you know, as broadly as you want, but, but certainly let's, let's address the, the, the narrow part, uh, which is what are we doing wrong? What are we doing right? What should we be doing that, that we're not? Um, I guess turn to Bonnie first on that. Well, I think that the United States should publicly emphasize uh, the differences between our one China policy and Beijing's one China principle uh, it should encourage other countries that have one China policies that differ from the one China principle to do the same. 
Um, and I think uh, the U.S. should call out China whenever it says that the United States recognized uh, China's position that Taiwan is part of China. Um, uh, we don't have to say it unless they distort what we say, but <laughs> if they distort what we say, then I think we should be quite explicit about what the normalization uh, communique said. Um, in addition, I think we should emphasize that China committed to peaceful resolution of its differences with Taiwan and that it has increasingly walked away from that commitment um, and uh, that encouraged China to return um, to its commitment to peaceful resolution. Um, so I'd start there. Um, uh, I would add that uh, I think that the U.S. does need to work more closely with allies and partners to challenge this PRC effort to establish its one China principle in the United Nations uh, based on resolution 2758. If there is pushback, if China is proven wrong, there's good possibility China will stop doing it. We haven't tried. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, a, one very welcome statement by a um, by Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Rick Waters last year was a good start, but the U.S. hasn't done much to follow up on that. So um, we we could, with like-minded countries, write a letter to the U.N. Secretary General expressing opposition uh, to Beijing's efforts to distort the meaning of the resolution and to block Taiwan's uh, meaningful participation uh, in the United Nations. Um, uh, one other thing that I would like to highlight, which we mentioned in our report, is that the International Organization of Standardization, the ISO, this is an independent NGO. It has a membership of um, 167 national standards bo bodies. It decided to use Taiwan province of China, and lots of uh, organizations use this um, uh, to base their decisions on. And so this uh, ISO usage um, has um, led to many organizations using Taiwan uh, province of China. So I would like to see um, the United States and its allies to press um, the ISO uh, to reverse uh, that decision. Something like that has been extremely, I think, harmful. Um, and then finally, what I just say is and to reemphasize what I said earlier, that I think that overall the United States has to have a credible one China policy and doing so requires that it has a strong reassurance component um, even in, it, in its broader deterrence policy uh, toward Beijing. Um, so if, if, if the United States is in fact um, not adhering to a one China policy of some definition, um, uh, not having official relations with Taiwan, it should be clear that there are some things we will not do. And I think we should make clear what those are and we should stick to them. Okay, thanks, Jessica. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, I would add that there are certain things that the U.S. could do more broadly at the U.N. level that would support Taiwan's meaningful participation and push back against um, China's influence at the U.N. that would also support broader U.S. interest within um, the international system. Um, to just name a few, I guess, in increased transparency, right? We know that there's one MOU. Are, are there more? There's been suggestions that there are a number um, after talking to uh, someone from the previous administration that was at the UN, that China has signed a number of secret MOUs across the board at the UN, not solely on Taiwan. Um, we should call for um, the text of those to be released. There's also um, things we can do in terms of staffing at the UN and at the UN level from the top down and the bottom up. Um, in terms of putting forth candidates for senior leadership positions as specialized agencies to ensure that, they, that these leaders uphold the values that the UN stand for instead of um, holding to the objectives, the policy preferences of one member state. Um, we've seen this, um, I guess, like at the WHO for one example, but there's a number of um, leadership positions where the Chinese preferred candidate has taken the helm.
Well, thanks. And as uh, the terrific set of policy recommendations are set out in uh, a bit more detail in the in the report, so I urge people to look at that. Again, the link is in the chat. Uh, and as you suggest, there's there's sort of a, as particularly Bonnie's reference to the ISO suggests, there are these other international organizations out there, which in some ways are are less tough nuts to crack uh, than, than the UN and, and uh, there are opportunities for Taiwan and for the US to support Taiwan where we our membership is, is potentially on the table and, uh, and, and we have seen some action in that space. Uh, we're coming up against our uh, time here, but since this is uh, 2022, I have to say Ukraine. Um, where does that fit into all of this? In fact, one of the first questions to come in, in the chat uh, points out that the UN has changed a bit. Um, after all, when the UN was founded, the Soviet Union was one of the P5, and if I remember correctly, Ukraine was one of three Soviet seats, uh, in addition to the real Soviet seat, I think it was Belarusia, uh, in the initial UN General Assembly. Uh, and of course, the ROC uh, was the representative, the Republic of China, the government now in Taiwan, was the representative of China. Both of those things have changed. Um, but Ukraine is back in the news, of course, uh, for all the obvious reasons. What does it mean for uh, this issue in the sense that we're talking, of course, about um, China's nightmare being that Taiwan is accepted to some degree as a sovereign state in the international system. Uh, and China's way of handling this has always been to sing loudly about the uh, sacrosanct nature of sovereignty and territorial integrity, with Taiwan being inside the Chinese fence, in China's view, uh, but therefore demanding that other folks, including the U.S., uh, not do things like what China includes, accuses the U.S. of doing now, of suborning uh, possible Taiwan independence or at least Taiwan autonomy. Well, China said some interesting things about Ukraine uh, and uh, has gotten a little close to Russia on that. So how does this, um, this issue of China's perhaps recently slightly diminished, but still um, notable uh, alignment with Russia over the Ukraine issue. Does that, does that have any resonance for the Taiwan issue or how to deal with the Taiwan issue in terms of international standing and space? Uh, we got about four minutes to cover that topic. <laughs> so let me uh, start with, uh, with Jessica and then go to Bonnie on that. Um, so I, I would say we've seen a lot of support, at least in on the Ukraine-Taiwan front, there's been a lot more vocal support um, between the two sides, given, I guess, a common threat from a from China and Russia. Um, I would say on the UN side, I'm less familiar with how, I guess, Russia, Russian influence at the UN, but I, I, I feel like Chinese influence at the UN partially is to prepare for a situation like this where they can say that the international norm is that um, Taiwan is a part of China so that they can push back against countries opposing any action they take against Taiwan. Yeah, so what we have seen interestingly is the Chinese position being that the Taiwan and Ukraine situations are completely different. Uh, there's no analogy because Ukraine at least has been recognized as state Taiwan isn't. Uh, while Taiwanese have, as Jessica points out, uh, been pretty positive about Ukraine and have drawn the analogies, uh, particularly the importance of the international community reacting against coercive measures uh, to change the, the status quo of, of, of uh, democratic governance in an autonomously run place. Uh, Bonnie, you get the last word on this weighty topic. <laughs> well, thank you, Jacques. Um, uh, there are uh, some useful analogies one can make between Taiwan and Ukraine, but at the end of the day, Taiwan is not Ukraine. Um, and uh, the way you're, the, um, uh, the questioner phrased this, this question, uh, the Soviet Union really did cease to exist, but we still have 14 um, that recognize uh, the Republic of China and have diplomatic relations with the Republic of China. Um, uh, it's at least 13 states and, uh, uh, and, and, and the Vatican. And uh, so I don't, I, I, I don't see that in this case, it's, it, it's really helpful in the overall context of the UN um, beyond the uh, frame of just, just the United Nations. Um, yes, there are, there are some, some useful uh, parallels of uh, Taiwan um, uh, potentially uh, being invaded by China as Russia has invaded uh, Ukraine. And it's been a wake up call for people in Taiwan. And uh, it has just as many in the international community have rallied uh, around uh, Ukraine, uh, Taiwan is hoping 
to capture some of that support and uh, and use that that support to um, uh, to prevent China from uh, from attacking and get countries to say that they would make uh, China pay a price, perhaps in terms of international sanctions as have been imposed on Russia. So there are some useful lessons that can be drawn, but I'm not sure it really helps us in the context of Taiwan's participation in the United Nations. Well, thanks. And thank you for tying that all up with a, a nice return to our, our core topic here after I did my best to lead us astray. Oh, I want to thank uh, Bonnie Glazer, the director of the Asia Program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, and Jessica Drun, non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub. It's been a terrifically rich discussion. Uh, thank you both for joining us today. Thank you all of us, all of you who are, uh, who are in our audience and, 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 um, and raising some really terrific questions. Uh, we could go on a lot longer, but we promised to go only an hour. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. I hope you'll continue to tune in for future Asia Program events. Uh, we are going to start doing some live stuff soon, uh, transition uh, away from doing all Zoom all the time. Uh, again, once uh, once again, thank you for joining us. Stay tuned for further programming, and please do look at the report. You can find the link in the chat here. Again, the title of the report is The Distortion of UN Resolution 2758 Limits on Taiwan's Access to the United Nations. Thank you again, Bonnie and Jessica. See you all soon. <laughs>